ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody from all over the world. Uh, today's webinar, we actually have guests from everywhere, uh, from the Americas, from Europe, and from Asia. So again, uh, good morning to all of you. And, uh, and I guess it might be evening or good afternoon to some of you. Uh, we are now, uh, again, let me introduce myself. My name is Roy Platon. I am the Philippine country manager for ACAD Asia. We are a Singaporean uh, startup with uh, presence in multiple countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, and because of the, and I'll be your moderator and host uh, for this morning's webinar. So uh, given the fact that uh, a huge number of our uh, attendees uh, actually come from Vietnam, uh, we have the pleasure of having a live uh, translator to help us with uh, uh, trying to uh, translate for you into Vietnamese. I'd like to introduce uh, Akad Asia Country Manager for Vietnam, Ms. Kuong Nguyen. Kuong, please say hi. Hi, Roy. Hi, everyone. Uh, xin chào tất cả các thầy cô ở Việt Nam. Uh, tôi là Liên Khương và đang đại diện cho Akadashia tại Việt Nam. Uh, không phải là dân chuyên nghiệp dịch thuật, nhưng hôm nay sẽ cố gắng hỗ trợ mọi người hết mình. Vì có lẽ cũng có một số giáo viên uh, 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 sử dụng tiếng Anh uh, cũng uh, được hạn chế, cho nên mình sẽ cố gắng dịch. Uh, uh, trước hết là các bạn sẽ theo dõi trên cái, cái closed caption, nó sẽ dịch bằng... Uh, Bằng typing nha. Vâng. Uh, thanks again. I hope you enjoyed the section. Uh, thank you, Roy. Thank you very much, uh, Guang. Uh, so during the, during the duration of the webinar, we will probably try to have some Vietnamese subtitles or live translation. So please bear with us as we uh, do those uh, translating. Uh, so, in general, just to give you a brief overview of uh, this morning's discussion, uh, today uh, we'll be having uh, uh, basically a sharing or discussion on best practices um, on how to migrate uh, to online learning. Uh, it's no surprise that, you know, in the world today, uh, COVID-19 has hit all countries uh, quite severely. Uh, businesses and stopped, and uh, most especially schools and institutions. Uh, students cannot come to campus. Uh, teachers cannot uh, actually uh, teach. And uh, now it's a big challenge for us in the education sector as to how to uh, bring this into, uh, you know, how to teach and continue teaching in this uh, new environment. So we have a guest from Akadasia to uh, actually help us uh, learn more about how the best practices are for this. And then later on, we also have a case study from Philippines on how uh, we have probably adopted and we actually have a partner school with us that has, was able to get um, on their classes online within one week, all right? So as soon as that, um, uh, and hopefully, uh, with those uh, sharings and uh, uh, and insights, you can learn something uh, to apply to your own schools and educational institutions today. Uh, so, what I've done right now, at least just to moderate the information in the chat, is I've disabled the chat for now. And what we can do is... Um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please use the Q&A button on the Zoom menu at the bottom. So you will see a Q&A button there. So please direct your questions there. And because we have so many attendees today, we'll do our best to uh, tackle them by themes. We'll group them together. And hopefully by uh, at, towards the end of this webinar, we can uh, go through some of those questions um, with you. Uh, and answer them for you. Okay, so uh, again, we'll have some sharings this morning. So first off to start, uh, we'd like to hear, of course, a welcome message uh, from 
uh, the founder and CEO of Akad Asia, live from Singapore, I'd like to introduce Mr. Nilesh Bhatia. Nilesh, please take it away. Thank you, Roy. Thank you very much. And a very, very good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, to everybody, we really, really appreciate your time uh, to come here today and join us and learn, hopefully, uh, on how uh, we can help you to migrate your classes online in the most easiest and the quickest manner possible. Uh, ACAT Asia is based in Singapore. We have offices uh, and country managers in Singapore, India, Vietnam, Philippines, and of course, Indonesia as well. At the end of this uh, webinar, should you have any further questions, please do feel free to contact any one of our offices in these countries, or you can contact us directly here in Singapore and we will channel your uh, inquiry to the respective country office. Rest assured, we are here to help and support all educators across Asia. And uh, it is our hope that all of you are able to provide a quality education to your students at any given point, from any time, at, at, at any time, from anywhere. And that's been um, our mission as well. And uh, we thank you once again for joining us here today. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Neil, for that message. Uh, so now we'll, I'd like to introduce our uh, first speaker for this morning. And that will be the bulk of our uh, topic for today because he actually has a wealth of experience in online education and e-learning. Uh, more than 20 years. In fact, his team, uh, when they actually, uh, uh, they actually won a, an award in 2017, I think uh, the, the best uh, e-learning team, I think in, uh, in, in Singapore. Um, he has a wealth of experience and is with one of the leading polytechnics. So without further ado, I, I, I'd like to introduce uh, Head of Academics, Mr. Mark Nivan Singh. Mark, take it away. Hi, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, it's a good, bright, sunny, cloudy day in Singapore. Uh, welcome to the webinar. I'll just switch to the uh, PowerPoint slides and then we will continue from there. So just give me a second as I uh, bring up the slides. Okay. Hello, everyone, again. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Mark, uh, and I'm very pleased to be with everyone here today. Uh, today, we will be talking about some of the things you need to think about when trying to shift to online learning, and more importantly, the design considerations that make online learning effective as we grapple with the COVID-19 situation uh, around the world. Uh, I will be sharing my experience uh, with our colleagues in Singapore. Uh, and I do hope that at the end, uh, when we do a Q&A, you can share some of your thoughts uh, as well. So a little bit about me. Uh, I've been an educator all my life. I have taught in secondary schools in Singapore. I was also heading a pedagogical team that focused on effective teaching and learning in an institute of higher learning. I have a master's degree in education, and as Roy mentioned earlier, in 2017, my team won the Blackboard Catalyst Award for Best Learning Professional Development Site. Now, in my free time, I look for innovative ways to, make, to help lecturers make learning engaging and, more importantly, meaningful for students. So this is what I thought we should cover for today. Uh, we have quite a number of things, uh, but uh, I, I hope you understand that because of uh, limited time, we won't go into too much detail, uh, but I hope to give you a good overview of things to look out for, uh, and then we can continue the conversation uh, either offline or through the Q&A. Uh, we will first look at things that you need to consider even before we talk about moving uh, learning online. 
then I think it would be wise to talk a little bit about students and learning. Uh, and that's where I'll share with you my thoughts on how much content we should be pushing to students and more importantly, how should the learning be structured for students. I will then share a little bit about how we can check that students are really learning now that they have shifted online. And then I also want to address a little bit about whether it is better to do synchronous or asynchronous learning. We will then wrap up the session by talking about what you can do with your existing content. And then I will take some questions that you may have for me and the team. Then I also like to leave some time for Q&A because I think it's also wise that we can share experiences uh, from around the world. So if you are ready, let's talk about some of the things to consider now that we think we need to move learning online and uh, keep the learning happening. Now, in order for online learning experience to be effective and meaningful, I sincerely believe that there are two key ingredients that must be present and considered even before we can claim we have had successful teaching and learning experience. These two ingredients are one, good solid protocols, and two, effective learning design. Now, for this first part of my sharing, we will focus on good, solid protocols. So what exactly do I mean when I say good, solid protocols? I would like to share with you a story that happened to me early in my career as a teacher. Truth be told, COVID-19 is not my first crisis as a teacher. I lived through SARS in 2003, and I lived through H1N1. Both of these times, I learned very valuable lessons about good protocols. For example, I spent many, yes, many hours designing my online learning classes for my students, but it was mostly all in vain because the organizations that I was working for then didn't have a comprehensive value chain plan and the technology that we had back then was not able to handle my very grand plans. So, we ended up resorting to printing worksheets and posting them to students. This obviously created a few problems. One, it was a nightmare to print and stick stamps and stuff these worksheets into envelopes to send out. Two, to make matters worse, some students never receive it at all. And three, it is obviously bad for the environment. Anyway, from my experience, it is therefore, I think, imperative if you are a school leader to have a comprehensive plan and stop take of the current capabilities and budget that you have. And more importantly, make clear to all stakeholders what is the stand towards online learning? When I say this, I'm reminded by Henry Ford's famous line, fail to plan, plan to fail. The second thing that I think we need to think about is to create a set of guidelines or cheat sheet available for your teachers or lecturers or educators so that you know the boundaries and can quickly get to work. If you Google after I finish my sharing, why online learning fails, it basically boils down to poor learning design and inappropriate use of technology. So I think it is important that school leaders spend some time and effort to provide guidelines based on the plan the school has. Another important tip is to think about the way that you are going to monitor the students' workload. From our experience in Singapore, year after year, when we conduct learning online, the number one complaint all students have is they felt that the workload is much more what they have in a face-to-face -face class than online. With that comes the importance of clear communication to students. Without clear communication on how to learn and what to learn, I'm pretty sure your students will lose interest very 
to eat. Trust me, it has happened to me before. Students couldn't even find the start learning button and the learning just went to bits even before it started. So now, while we have spoken a lot about students, I think the instructors, lecturers, teachers themselves are also critical stakeholders in the whole equation. What kind of support are we providing them? Where do they go for help if they need it? How are you helping them level up so that they can provide excellent learning experience for students? So lastly, I also think that it is important that management thinks about how you are going to obtain student feedback on the learning experience. Don't discount this. This is important and it will help management make better and more informed decisions in the future. I'm particularly reminded by this quote by Albert Einstein. Insanity is doing the same things over and over again and expecting the different result. So now that we have looked at good, solid protocols, let's look at the other components. My pet topic is something that I hold very dear to my heart. Effective learning design. And I want to start by looking at students and learning. If there is one thing that you should take away from my sharing with you today is this. Just because you are merely shifting the mode of learning from traditional classroom to an online environment does not mean and guarantee that learning will automatically happen. You cannot realistically expect students to learn on their own online. Let us be real. The teacher, instructor, lecturer is absolutely critical and is the catalyst here. The same principles of good, effective pedagogical principles apply just as importantly online, just as we do in a normal face to face class. In fact, as I was preparing for this webinar, the past few days, all I read about is how learn online learning is a failure and students are not learning at all. Maybe it's a good time now to really revisit some of these key principles of learning. I'm sure some of them could be quite familiar to many of you, but I would think that it would be wise to just go through this very quickly so that we understand the base that we are operating from. Now, one of the key principles of learning must include having motivational strategies that are incorporated into the design of learning. Now, if you take a step back and think about this, many e-learning designs are simply just mounds and mountains of text that is just put online in the hope that students can navigate the complexity of all this learning and somehow learning will happen. That to me is a little bit irresponsible in my opinion because students, whether they are in the face-to-face -face classroom or learning online, need motivational strategies. The other thing that I think we need to be quite clear about, and we need to think about very clearly is your learning goals, objectives, and proficiency expectations are clearly made visible to learners. This means that learners know exactly what they are getting themselves into and they themselves should be able to regulate their learning so they know what is expected of them. Do not again underestimate the importance of providing these objectives and outcomes clearly right at the beginning for students. The other thing that I think is really, really not so uh, done in a, a consistent manner is how are we leveraging on students' prior knowledge? so that we can activate it and connect it to new learning. Another interesting thought would be is really making use of technology in an online environment, which is principle number four, to enhance learning through multiple methods and presentation modes. Now, with the technology available and the use of edutech tools such as videos, podcasts, quizzes, and even discussion boards, 
really help to engage the whole range of senses. Now, number five, this is particularly important to me. I focus on this a lot. To me, this transcends every important rule in or principle of learning. And that is content is organized around key concepts and principles that are fundamental to understanding the structure of the subject. So here's a challenge for you. Think about this for a second. Many of you who are here online now are content matter experts in your subject. If I was to issue you a challenge, can you distill the principles and concepts of your subject area into four major concepts? Can you do it? Think about this for a second. By doing so, it really just emphasizes or highlights what is key learning for your students without necessarily creating a lot of fluff that comes along with it. And we will discuss this in greater detail as we move along. So principle number six is looking at good thinking promotes the building of understanding. If we just pile mounds and mounds of text online and we do not help students to grapple or interact with the content, you don't really build understanding. And that means learning is basically not happening. Number seven, learning design utilizes the working of the working of memory systems. We all know that students forget easily. We always tend to find ourselves repeating content over and over again. And there's a reason for this. It's because our students really have poor memory systems. So on the learning online gives us the opportunity to really ensure that we make use of technology to help our students learn and memorize things more effectively. And that brings us to principle number eight, which is the development of expertise requires deliberate practice. Now, this is one of the internal truths in learning that I think we all acknowledge. To be really good at something, you need to practice. In fact, Malcolm Gladwell wrote, you need 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to be an expert in something. So that's the same concept that I think we need to apply even in an online uh, environment where we really need to find ways to give students opportunities to practice and interact with the content that we want them to learn. Now, number nine to me is also one of the more important things that maybe we do not think about uh, uh, seriously when we do online learning. And that is assessment practices are integrated into the learning design to provide quality feedback. If you forget everything I've talked about so far, the research is very clear. You need to provide quality feedback for your students when they are learning online. In fact, in his groundbreaking book, Visible Learning, John Hattie says the number one method that helps with improving learning is quality feedback by the instructor, lecturer, teacher. So think about this. How can we provide quality feedback to every one of our students who is learning online? And number 10, a psychological climate is created with success, which is success-oriented and fun. And I think this is where online learning really has an opportunity or an affordance to really uh, offer uh, an environment which can be success-oriented and fun. So the main point that I'm trying to make here is that these principles are eternal, regardless of the mode of learning, and that designers of e-learning must pay attention to these principles if they want to do successful learning. Uh, Roy, it maybe it's now a good time for us to do the poll. Uh, Roy? Yes, we can try to put up the poll now. Yeah, can we run the poll now? So the poll questions that's coming up are uh, based on the principles that we just talked about. Look at the question and I would love to hear your thoughts. So now there should be a poll appearing uh, on the screen of everybody. Uh, we'll just give a few minutes to allow everybody, maybe 30 seconds to one minute, to allow everybody to answer the poll and then Mark can continue from there. Um, again, we'd like to thank everybody who's joining us from all over the world. Uh, good morning, 
good afternoon, good evening to you, wherever you are. And uh, amidst this uh, COVID-19 crisis that we are all going through, uh, we at Acad Asia are here to help support you as you try to understand and uh, migrate to online learning and to get your schools and institutions um, online and to continue the education that uh, our young people need desperately, especially now in these times where there's a lot of uncertainty uh, and we have to adjust and adapt as human beings so that we can actually continue. We have every confidence that uh, as, a, as the entire world uh, tries to keep the virus in check, that we will see this through. And uh, education uh, is one of the areas where we need to be able to provide so that uh, people will be better informed and learn actually how to, uh, how to study online. So some of, the, some of the questions are trickling in slowly. So uh, although we only have about half of the participants uh, answering the poll, I can actually end the poll now. And then, Mark, maybe you can look at the result, I guess. This is not a surprise to you. <laughs> so we're going to share the results with everybody now. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, so actually the results, uh, thank you for that. I thank you for participating in the poll. Uh, yes, uh, I think even in our previous session, uh, where we talked to some other educators around the world, they basically agree that these principles apply regardless of the context. I think the challenge now would be to include these principles in an online environment. Now, due to the shortage of time, and because I'm only just sharing uh, core, core ideas, uh, we won't be going into details, but if you're interested to know more how we can integrate these principles for effective learning, uh, please speak to any of the Cat Asia staff who can help upskill your lecturers. So let's move on. Now that we have reminded ourselves about principles of learning, I think I want to address this question that many instructors or lecturers always like to ask. So Mark, let's talk about how much content is enough because I have lots of content. I think what we need to think about is there is no easy answer to this question. It really depends on the profile of your students. But I do know one thing that is true, and I've mentioned this earlier. Our students in Singapore especially are notoriously poor at remembering things. And again, just because we shove them online does not mean that they learn. So more is not always better. The other thing that we need to think about is you really need to think about the nature of your subject. How is it best presented? What is the essence of your subject and what are the concepts that make up the subject? I hope you are still thinking about my challenge that I issued to you about five minutes ago, which is, can you distill the essence of your content into four main concepts? So, what I think we need to think about then is, after we have done that, how are we going to present the content? Is it best through a simple explainer video? Do they need to see it step by step? Would an animation be better? Or is audio good enough? I think we also need to think about helping them remember. And more importantly, again, it is not about piling on content after content because not everyone will go through everything. More importantly, I also think it is also about introducing formative assessments to help students consistently check for their learning and understanding and also to provide feedback for the lecturer and instructor on what is working and what is not so that the instructor can then make changes on the fly. So this leads us to one of the big questions. How then should I structure my learning for the students? I think what I'm showing you now is familiar to many of us. 
it is Ghani's ninth event of construction and it is, in my opinion, an evergreen model. I have specifically chosen it because it dovetails nicely with the principles of learning. For example, look at the second event of instruction. It says to inform learners of the objectives. And if you remember principle two in the previous slides, learning goals, objectives, and performance expectations are clearly visible to learners. You can see why this model provides an easy to use guide on how instructors should structure our learning. First, gain the student's attention. This can be in the form of a video or even a controversial statement. Then make clear the expectations and what is it that students will be learning from you by attending this online class. Then structure learning by activating prior knowledge with things that students are familiar with so that they can easily connect and learn new concepts. You can then present the content. And what is important in my opinion about this model, again, let me emphasize, is the opportunity for the lecturer to provide guidance and feedback. This goes back to what I said earlier. You cannot just dump some content online and expect your students to learn it. There must be feedback and consistent guidance, which brings me to the next important point. So how do I check if my students are really learning? Now, I think when it comes to checking for understanding, we can divide it into two components, knowledge items and skill-based items. In my humble opinion, it is easier to do an assessment of knowledge items online. And these can take the form of MCQs, fill in the blank, matching items, and even crossword puzzles. For skills-based items, for lecturers such as uh, people who teach practical skills, performance-based assessments are better methods to make informed judgments of student skills. However, in light of the fact that it would be difficult for students to come together in this present environment to do a skills-based assessment, you as an instructor can mitigate this, getting them to work on case studies, posing problem-based questions, or even getting them to do video submissions of them practicing the skill or doing a performance. I just want to emphasize this clearly. While this is not perfect, it will go in some way in checking for student learning and ensure that you are not wasting your time putting online learning. The best part is, if you think about it, these items do not need to happen online synchronously. It can be done offline and submitted when students return to school after the situation has stabilized. So another question that gets asked a lot is, so if we are talking about moving learning online, should it be synchronous or asynchronous? Before I share with you the pros and cons of each, I think it might be useful for me to share my own personal thoughts. Personally, when people ask me, so Mark, when you do your e-learning design, what do you go for? Do you go with synchronous or asynchronous? Personally, I feel that going synchronous, asynchronous, I beg your pardon, is best. Why? Asynchronous, in my opinion, allows me more time to plan more effectively, decide on how best to deliver the concepts and content, and also allow me to choose a wide variety of tools to check for my student understanding. The best part, students can access it anywhere, anytime, I can support my students' learning anytime without any sense of time pressure. Now, the one time I tried to do synchronous learning, the technology didn't work. There was an issue with the microphone and managing students in an online environment was far more challenging than of course doing it face-to-face. Now, you may of course disagree with me. That's just my personal opinion. 
And there are advantages in doing synchronous teaching. Some of them include real-time discussion. Everybody is in the same room. You can have face-to-face -face discussion. It brings the whole social element together when we do things like real-time collaboration. There's also opportunity for the instructor or lecturer to provide immediate feedback, which I have emphasized earlier, a critical component in students' learning. It can be relatively cost-effective in getting lots of people online at the same point and then conducting a lesson. And the facilitator can quickly gauge the understanding of concepts and making changes to the teaching and learning immediately on the spot to ensure that he or she can close the knowledge gaps. And some students do find this motivating so that they can complete the assignments of the course because they feel that the lecturer is always available. As with asynchronous, I would just like to emphasize that uh, some of the advantages include anytime, anywhere learning. Many of my students have told me they do not like to learn early in the morning. They like to spend the night when bandwidth is better to do their learning. They like to access materials when it is convenient, it is their time, and not be bounded by, I need to be online at this particular moment in time. Asynchronous also provides them an opportunity to research some answers, to really reflect on their learning, and more importantly, to engage with deep learning. And this allows them to express their thoughts without any kind of interruption. Now, there are also disadvantages for each. And I think for synchronous, this is one of the disadvantages, and that would be is you need to coordinate it in such a way that everybody needs to be at the same time and same place. It may require some technical knowledge, although I think with the advances in technology, uh, this is now being reduced, and it does require some form of technical infrastructure. What happens if we are not all blessed or privileged enough to have good, solid infrastructure? Then synchronous learning may actually be a disadvantage. The cost is only as good as the facilitator. As with face-to-face -face teaching, it all boils down to how good is the design and how good is the lecturer or instructor. And learners, unfortunately, do not get to learn at their own pace. There is very little opportunity for deliberate practice. They cannot go back and interact with the information at their own pace at their own time. But that doesn't mean that asynchronous does not have its disadvantages as well. Some of this may include, and this is one of a real concern, is learners may feel a lack of connection because they are interacting with the information at their own time. They may not necessarily be online together with their classmates, and this might be quite lonely, so to speak. So therefore, selfish uh, learning does require a level of motivation to complete the course. And more importantly, sometimes there is delayed feedback. Students may not necessarily get an answer immediately, especially if one of my students who post a question or ask for help at 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm pretty sure he or she will not be able to get an answer within the next 10 minutes. And again, there is no immediate access to facilitator if there are any questions or if there's a technical issue that they are facing, they are unable to solve it. So we will now look at the next uh, part of the webinar, which I would like to spend a little bit more time here. So what can I do with existing content? It is a question that I get asked a lot by my colleagues uh, and new lecturers uh, who, when they join the new institute, join the institute, always ask, but Mark, I have a lot of content already. What can I do with my existing content? Do I really need to create new content? The good news is, no, you do not. So I try to create a simple schematic to help our lecturers figure out how they can develop this quite quickly, deploy it within the next two to three days, should the need arise. I think right at the very beginning, we need to understand is, what is it that you want your students to learn? So it goes back to the principles of outcome-based education. Are you able to clearly state what are the outcomes that you would expect for students to be able to achieve by learning this course online? 
you would then need to organize the learning into concepts. Yes, it's going back to the challenge I issued earlier again. You really need to think about organizing your learning into key learning concepts. Then, decide if the nine events is the way to go. Now, there are many other models, but for the sake of today's session, I'm just providing one. You can, you can look for more or maybe drop me an email. I'll be more than happy to share with you other models. But you need to decide if the nine events is the way to go. And when you do decide that it is the way to go, you really need to take out pen and paper. Yes, really take out pen and paper. Start to plan and organize the learning from your student's point of view. Think about this from their point of view and you will be able to see what's actually going to work what it is not going to work. The next thing that you should then think about is, can you reuse your content? You will be surprised, and I'm pretty sure that many of this content that you have is reusable. I would also like to suggest that maybe you should curate and not create new items for your online learning. You can curate with the many professional learning communities that you're already part of. You can even go to YouTube, you can even look for instructional videos. And I think many of you are already familiar with the idea of Teacher Tube, which has many, many instructional videos that you can take and use for your students' learning. The next thing then you should think about is really what kind of assessment do I need to provide for my students check for their learning. Uh, and I would like to emphasize is this is not what I would call a high stakes sort of an exam. This is just little simple activities that you would want to incorporate to ensure that my students are really benefiting from learning online and that they are picking up uh, information uh, that I'm putting up online. You will then need to develop the material and again I would like to emphasize look for opportunities to curate rather than develop from scratch. Then, more importantly, sit down and create the instructions for students on how they can navigate the learning and how they should be interacting with the content. I cannot emphasize this enough. Again, it goes back to what I mentioned earlier. Don't provide clear instructions and be sure Many of your students already give up on the learning before they even start. The other thing that I think you should think about is you should monitor the learning and the quality of interactions that is going on in your course. Why? Because this provides you the opportunity to provide feedback and also to understand what students really are getting from your lessons and are they really learning? Or are they struggling with certain ideas and concepts? Now, it shouldn't stop there. The final step that you should do is to really ask for feedback from your learners. What was the experience like for them? And this is important because uh, as I have done this with my own students, I realized that they are telling me things from a learner's perspective that myself as an instructor may not have considered. And that is why I have now created the one about create the instructions for students because many of them say while the design is good, they actually have no idea of how to navigate the learning. What should they do first? What should they do next? And so forth. So think about this. Ask for feedback from learners. Uh, you may not like some of the feedback that they give, but if you start early, it gives you the opportunity to ensure that we create good and effective learning for our students. So I thought I'll just do a quick summary. We are about to come to the end of um, my sharing about do's and don'ts. Uh, number one, use what you already have, but don't just put what you already have online and expect students to know. You need to provide a guide and plan for effective learning. You cannot expect students to be self-directed or expect them to learn on their own it is highly unlikely to happen. You do need to check for student understanding often. 
don't assume students are learning without checking. Curate the many resources that the internet and the web has, tap the professional development communities. Don't try and redevelop every material. It is going to be a mammoth and almost impossible task. Do allow students to interact and contribute towards the learning. Don't just let your students consume, make them contributors. And this is where I feel it is important as a motivating factor when students now feel they are part of the learning and not just simple consumers. So that's a challenge for you as well. How then do you let your students become contributors towards their own learning? Do make use of the free tools made available. Personally, I never ever buy tools for e-learning. Uh, if the organization doesn't buy them in an enterprise license, I do not spend money buying them because to me, there are many free tools available that you can make use of. So do not buy expensive tools that you will only use once. Okay? Another do is apply the KISS principle, keep it, simpler, keep it simple, simply, and more is not always better. Another do organize the learning in a clean and efficient manner. Do not crowd, overly crowd things with extra graphics. It really doesn't help with the learning. So don't assume your students will be able to navigate your learning intuitively uh, just because they are considered digital, uh, born in the digital uh, age, doesn't mean that they are able to navigate the learning easily. That was to my cause and horror when I realized that actually students needed step-by-step -step instructions of how to navigate the learning. You should, as good practice also, provide extra learning materials for students that can help reinforce their learning and also for students who want more of this extra learning. And you shouldn't teach more than necessary, especially in an online, an online learning. So I'd just like to quickly share with you some of the tools that I have found useful, and they are free, that I use uh, quite a lot uh, even when I'm doing my e-learning. One is a screencast omatic where you can easily record your voice for PowerPoint and create quick explainer videos. Padlet, where you can use, uh, use it to allow students to post their views to check for student understanding. I've also used how tools where you can create comic strips to teach concepts. And now I have also extended use of how tools to my students where I get them to create comic strips to make sure. I know they understand the content that I'm trying to teach them. You can also use websites like anchor.fm and you can create podcasts, short, sweet podcasts to students and distribute it to them so that they can learn on the go. And also use websites like Canva where you can create powerful infographics and free ebooks you can distribute to your students. And of course, with the tool that we are using now, Zoom, have live discussions with your students online. I personally like to use Zoom to target my feedback to my students when I need to do more group, small group based type of instruction or to give personalized feedback to students. Or of course, you can use Biju. Now, if Biju is a learning management platform uh, and we are currently offering uh, such Trainer upskilling program where we can dive deeper into the principles that we've been talk, uh, talking about for the last uh, 20 30 minutes uh, and help lecturers really develop engaging online learning experiences. You can also enroll an unlimited number of students and instructors or teachers online for free lifetime access of materials and information. You get to upload your own curriculum again for free and integrate with Teams or Slack for live communication and making use of other free educational technology tools that you can do together with you. And more importantly, keep up with the digital age, the issuance of certifications through a blockchain certification system, and also allowing for customization of local languages. So if you're interested, you can contact the people on the list here. Uh, I have really come to the end of my presentation. Uh, I thank you for spending some time with me. 
Uh, and I would really love to hear some of your thoughts about how you are doing e-learning or learning online. And you can post some of the questions uh, in the Q&A and I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you very much, everybody. Hey. Okay, Mark, thank you so much uh, for those interesting insights. Uh, we actually had a flurry of questions coming from all over. And uh, Nilesh and I have been trying to answer as much as we can, but some we kind of left uh, here and we'll group them according to themes. And so that uh, towards the Q&A portion, uh, towards the end of this webinar, we can tackle them together so that everyone can learn. Um, so, Right now, uh, we've basically heard um, best practices from Singapore, you know, so uh, approaches to online and e-learning and, you know, sometimes it also starts from the offline and how you approach, uh, approach the structuring your lessons and the education of the student and then using the tools so that you can actually present it and discuss it properly and, of course, assessing afterwards. So this will just be a quick, uh, a quick run through of what uh, Freeju would look like um, from a student perspective. Let me just move my windows here a little bit. So uh, this is what the student will see initially. It will, uh, this is basically the homepage and this is an example. This is basically the standard template. If your school or institution would, would like to customize this front page, uh, in addition, that is also available, but um, that needs to be discussed in a business arrangement. And all the courses are listed here. So when the student first signs in, there's a sign-in page. And I've done that already ahead of time to save us time because we probably have about 40 minutes for Q&A. So let's go into one course. So this is one of our uh, courses that we offer, the e-accelerator program. Uh, and uh, we offer this uh, to students uh, who want to learn entrepreneurship. Okay, so I need to sign in with a different uh, account so we can see the, the inside of it. Let me just do that really quickly here. So uh, we try to focus on making it as, as simple as possible uh, for users both teachers and students. Because the last thing we want is um, for it to have you know, too much technology or too many features. Like some of you probably are already familiar with uh, Blackboard and uh, other, uh, other LMS systems. So ours, we try to make it as simple as possible. So this is, let's say if I'm a student, these are the courses I would, I would see. And then if I wanted to get into the course, so this is an example of the program map for the entrepreneurship course, the e-accelerator program. You can see the weeks here, uh, the modules inserted. And then let's say we start the course as a student. Okay, let's get started. Um, as much as there's a tool, it's also how you design your course. So it will depend on, let's say, how the weeks are mapped out. Typically, we suggest that there's an introduction course so that you kind of get used to it. Okay, what are the things that you can do in the platform? What's the, uh, what are the program guidelines, introduction and whatnot? And then you have all the features here, inserting text, video, assessments. So you can actually include all of that here in Freeju. And basically, you start from adapting it from your existing syllabus chop it up into weeks and into sections, into bite-sized portions, and then you can upload it to the system. Okay, so let's go now to the Q&A portion. And there were a lot of questions. So what we're gonna do is, um, we're gonna try to group them according to how they were asked. So we have a few themes here. Obviously, um, most of the questions had something to do with, um, had something to do with the, the pedagogy, teaching techniques, and teaching philosophy. So, so there's a question here regarding um, with the advent of the Stark scenario, what can you suggest to government and to private public companies to support online teaching and learning? Um, and I think Joel touched a little bit on that, but would um, anyone else like to comment on, I guess, um, how governments and educational institutions can work together? 
Okay, I think uh, I will probably take that. I think it's very, very important, especially now, uh, for the government um, agencies to kind of really work uh, a lot uh, closer with edutech platforms like us, uh, so that the students and the teachers who desperately need support are able to get that support in time. Uh, if you look at the current statistics, uh, apparently about 300 million students globally are not able to go to school. And uh, when students don't go to school and they are not, uh, and, and their learning stops, uh, the future uh, of, the, of the country, of the economy gets affected. And uh, in order to be able to, uh, you know, not get into those kind of issues 10, 15 years down the line, it is very, very important for the governments to actually work with platforms like uh, ACAD Asia um, to be able to make uh, the platform available at no cost to the schools so that the schools can provide an effective education no matter where they are. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Nilesh, for that. So the other groups of questions, um, I'll take uh, probably this, uh, this theme. So some questions were related to um, different types of students. So children, younger students, undergrad students. So some of the questions are, um, and how do we create an online lesson that is appropriate for preschool students? Um, there's another question here about, the case study talks mainly about postgraduate students who are matured. How do you deal with undergrad students, mostly first year, second year, very unstable, not ready to accept this way of learning? They're only watching videos, but not participating. And then there's another related question. It's difficult for us to check the students' work. So any advice for younger students, undergrads, those are you know, hard to get their attention. Um, uh, maybe uh, does Mark have Mark? Do you have any insight as to how do you deal with um, undergrad students and uh, younger students? It's hard to get their attention, keep them focused, keep them engaged. Yeah. So I I think uh, it's it's a double edged sword. Uh, at the same time, while we look at the model, gain attention, technology has a has the power to motivate and at the same time maybe distract uh, students. So I, I think if we, if we can contain it in a little package, and that's why I keep on going back to the idea about structuring your content around key concepts and keeping it uh, within that parameters, short, bite-sized sort of learning, uh, you, you, you prevent them really from going off uh, on a... On, on a, you know, distracted, oh, I like this, uh, I look at that, oh, there's a YouTube video that links to another YouTube video, and then that's it, you have lost them. So if, if we can keep them within, contained within that little uh, bite-sized package, uh, I think that, that would help tremendously. Uh, it, it prevents the whole idea about, you see, the whole point about learning online, I don't know why some people always tend to equate it that it is actually fun. Uh, I'm not so sure uh, that, you know, just because you put some stuff online, it automatically becomes fun. Uh, I think it is deliberate design that is needed to make it actually interesting, but at the same time, uh, not just edutainment, but also uh, learning. Okay, Mark, thanks for that. You know, I almost forgot that we have a special guest because we have a translator in the audience. So, Huang is diligently typing. So, if you guys see the subtitles there, she's the one. That, so, we'll, we'll do this, uh, what we call um, beauty pageant style. Okay, so I'll invite Kuang to turn on her camera. I, I will try to ask a question in English. She will briefly translate it to Vietnamese. And I'd like to request the panelists to also answer briefly so that Kuang will also have, have a chance to translate verbally in Vietnamese because we have a lot of Vietnamese guests in the audience. So Kuang, are you there? Say hi. Yes. Yeah, okay. I'm working hard. <laughs> Okay, cool. okay. Các thầy cô ở Việt Nam mình có đặt câu hỏi nào không ạ? À? Tại vì mình nhìn thấy trong các cái cái list uh, Q&A không có thấy thầy cô nào hỏi hết hay là hay là để sau này hỏi riêng với Khương. <cười> I just say I ask if the Vietnamese teachers uh, have any questions because I don't see any out there. So probably they can ask me later. They have my contact email that uh, Nilas just sent in the chat box. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, so, 
Okay, I'll just try to go through. Okay, the last group of questions are mostly regarding pedagogy, teaching techniques, and teaching philosophy. So I'll just go through some of them here at a time. Um, so for example, here, there's one question, like they say, uh, our guest from Indonesia, she's saying they use thematic modeling in teaching. Is this more effective to have the thematic, thematic modeling and is the duration of the time enough because they have private, uh, private pu pu pupils in private schools? She teach privately. So I guess the question is thematic modeling of teaching and is the duration long enough? So Mark, uh, sorry, Kuang, can you translate in Vietnamese? And then we'll have Mark answer that. Just a minute. Yeah, uh, our guest from Indonesia. Yeah, I suggest that Roy, can you uh, pause uh, at the end of one or two questions then uh, that I can be able to follow you? Okay, so she's asking a thematic model of teaching and is the duration, does the duration matter? So I guess how long they are teaching and does the theme, the model of teaching using themes, is that effective for online teaching? Uh, đã có đặt, có các thầy cô có, có đặt một câu hỏi là cái thời lượng để mà đưa lên học online như thế nào là phù hợp hay nói cách khác đó là cái, cái, cái cách thức mà mình đưa lên online làm sao cho nó phù hợp với nhiều lứa tuổi khác nhau Thanks Roy Ok, thanks Mark, uh, thematic learning yeah. and duration So I actually, yeah, I actually reply uh, I think thematic learning again uh, when you, when you build learning around themes, the first idea would be is uh, there's a lot of supporting structure that comes to it. Uh, and my concern with thematic, I'm not saying it's wrong, don't get me wrong, I think it's actually quite a good way of uh, structuring the learning, is really how much do you really need to support the key concepts. Uh, and if you are going online, we want it to be efficient, we want it to be quick, we want it to be effective. So uh, that's when subject matter experts need to come in and design that just key concepts that need to be put up. Uh, anh, anh Mark chia sẻ là ở đây uh, chúng ta nên tập trung vào là uh, cái, cái những cái yếu tố uh, về cái nội dung chủ yếu mà chúng ta cần support, uh, cần, cần hỗ trợ cho người học. Thì vì chúng ta muốn học online thì nhanh và uh, hiệu quả um, để mà có thể uh, cho học sinh tập trung vào với chúng ta thì cần có một những cái sự hỗ trợ về công nghệ uh, hoặc là một số các cái phần mềm để mà mình uh, khi mà mình thiết kế một cái nội dung khóa học online thì uh, chúng ta cần những cái hỗ trợ như thế. Thanks Mark. Thank you. Okay, thanks Quang. Um... I think there was a message sent to you uh, directly for um, Vietnamese uh, questions in Vietnamese directly. So while you're looking through those, I'm going to look at a couple of probably simpler questions here. And um, there's another question here, uh, which I find very interesting. Um, Mark, so the question is, could you please explain more about this? Don't just put what you already have online. Yeah. So the comment was, I guess, relating to just throwing whatever existing yeah. lesson material and just throwing that online yeah. straight away. Um, yeah. Can you explain further? And sorry, Kuang, did you get that? Could you translate that in? Yes, in I got some interesting question here. Uh, oh how to control the student uh, online if they play game or open Facebook. You won't know about that. Uh, All right. Xin trả lời cái câu, uh, xin uh, vừa mới dịch cho Roy cái câu của bạn thầy, cô thầy tên là Cường, Dương Cường. Uh, nếu mình đang học online thì uh, học sinh, mình sẽ không thể nào mình quản lý học sinh. Có thể học sinh sẽ mở máy ra chơi game hoặc là uh, lướt Facebook. Yeah. Uh, please, Roy. <laughs> okay, Mark, um, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll answer the first one first, which is uh, what do I mean by uh, don't just use uh, content. So I gave three examples in the question when I replied. Number one is uh, every teacher uses has got instructional material that they already have. Uh, 
uh, in Singapore, we have a lot of PowerPoint. So some of the things that I've seen include things like, let's just take the PowerPoint and put it up, and then keep our fingers crossed and hope that students are learning. To me, it doesn't make sense. Because when you design that PowerPoint, it was designed in a face, for a face-to-face -face type of session. It could add extra things that you may not necessarily have uh, thought about in an online environment. So, Kuang, you want to answer that first? You want to translate that first? You mean that PowerPoint is not good? No, or? what I'm saying is, many lecturers or teachers already have PowerPoints available. You should not just take PowerPoint and put it online and say that's online learning material. Yeah. Anh Mark chia sẻ là thực ra khi sử dụng PowerPoint để mà dạy học online thì rất 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 nhiều giáo viên chúng ta đang đang dùng cái PowerPoint như là một cái phương tiện. Tuy nhiên chúng ta không nên chỉ dựa vào PowerPoint. Thì chúng ta xem anh Mark nói thêm gì. Mark, thanks. Yeah. The other thing is put PowerPoints up put the tutorial sheet up and then expect students to somehow use the PowerPoint to answer the tutorial sheets without any kind of help. Again, not a good idea. Uh, Mark nói rằng uh, một, nếu mà các thầy cô đưa lên một bên là PowerPoint, một bên là giống như mình dạng bài tập để trò cho học trò, mình nhìn PowerPoint xong mà trả lời câu hỏi thì cái bên thì đó cũng không phải là một cách học tốt. Yeah, Mark. Uh, and the other thing that uh, I think we should not do when I say we have materials is we add more items into the PowerPoint and then put it up. So from 30 PowerPoint slides become 65 PowerPoint slides. Uh, Mark cũng nói rằng một điều nữa cũng không nên làm là uh, chúng ta đưa quá nhiều PowerPoint lên cho học sinh thậm chí trong ví dụ PowerPoint là có 30 trang chúng ta lại đưa thêm thành 50, 60 trang như thế thì đó cũng là không phải là một cái ý tưởng tốt để mà dạy học online. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Mark. Okay. So to answer Kwong's question, uh, how do I manage uh, online learning so that students are not going on Facebook and so forth? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so there are two ways in which I deal with this. Uh, one, I try not to do synchronous learning. I try not to do live lectures like this. Okay. Uh, because I'm not present, I'm not there, to me, it's quite difficult. I'm not saying that it's bad, uh, but after a while, people tend to get distracted. Let's go and look at something else. So what I do, I like to design uh, online learning that requires students to participate. How? Discussion boards, answer questions, create new things, do research. Keep them occupied. Ok, à, để mà trả lời câu hỏi là làm thế nào để quản lý học sinh là để học sinh không có chơi game mặt nước Facebook thì cái có hai cách, cái cách thứ nhất là thiết kế cái thiết kế cái học online à, à, theo các cái à, phương thức mà trong cái bài presentation anh anh Mark có nói ấy, là ví dụ mình đưa ra một cái thảo luận nhóm Uh, trả lời câu hỏi tạo ra thêm nhiều cái uh, tạo ra thêm nhiều cái uh, lựa chọn thêm cho học sinh và hãy để cho học sinh làm những cái nghiên cứu nhỏ nhỏ yeah that's the first way Mark. yeah yeah so uh, really to do I think okay the challenge is you have to be better or more interesting than Facebook how do you do that is to me in Singapore, if you just get your students to read things online, it is not more interesting than Facebook. How do you make it as interesting as Facebook? Where is the interaction? Get them to work together, solve a problem together. That's one example. Uh, Ma cũng suggest làm vì vậy thì làm thế nào má cũng cũng đưa ra ý tưởng là làm thế nào cho học sinh tập trung vào cái việc học online thay vì Facebook tất nhiên để xem Facebook thì chúng ta biết nó cũng rất là thú vị có nhiều cái cách để uh, tương tác nhận thông tin uh, thì cái cách học chúng ta online thì má cũng đề nghị là làm sao mà chúng ta tương tác nhiều hơn với học sinh uh, đưa ra một số cái dạng đọc hiểu xong rồi trả lời câu hỏi thảo luận uh, 
nghiên cứu thêm một số các vấn đề khác ngoài bài học tức là phải làm sao cho học trò mình nó uh, có thể mức độ tự học yeah. However, Mark, I, I, I see that uh, that can be for the um, higher uh, student but uh, for the lower one the okay. younger one is my uh, they are not just uh, don't have the self concert or self discipline to do that yeah. kind of thing so one other way which i was suggesting when i was typing in the q a is if you go online and you look there are many educational games that you can use for younger students yeah um mình cũng quay lại hỏi mát là ví dụ cho học sinh nghiên cứu hay là tự tự làm bài tập rồi là, nghiên cứu thêm rồi thảo luận nhóm thì phù hợp với các học sinh lớn hơn còn thế thế thì đối với các học sinh nhỏ thì nó cũng chưa có được cái ý thức uh, kỷ luật á thì mát chat mát cũng là đưa ra ý tưởng là uh, chúng ta có thể tìm thấy rất rất nhiều các cái uh, trò chơi học thuật ở trên uh, uh, internet thì chúng ta có thể tích hợp và uh, giáo viên cũng phải chịu khó tìm hiểu một số các cái cái trò chơi này để mà ứng dụng cho học sinh nhỏ hơn, nhỏ tuổi hơn. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Okay, yeah. okay great. Uh, we're just doing a type check. It's one minute to one o'clock. So there are lots of questions and we've really just touched on a few of them. Uh, what we've done is we're going to archive these questions and come back to all of you uh, as soon as we can on our answers. So Um, before we uh, sign off, maybe Kuang, you can say uh, a nice uh, final word for our Vietnamese friends <laughs> in closing. Yeah. Um, rất cảm ơn các thầy cô đã tham gia hôm nay. Thật sự là trong uh, uh, hôm nay cũng gần đăng ký là hơn 500 á, thì uh, Việt Nam mình là chiếm số đông nhất là đến 300, uh, 300 mấy lần, 350, 380 lần thì đó là một cũng dấu hiệu mà mình rất là vui à, vì Ankadasia thì rất là một cái công ty mới tuy nhiên à, các anh ấy rất là rành về công nghệ và cũng như về học thuật thì những trường học mà đã đã thực hiện cái cái nền tảng này rồi á, thì à, thường ở các nước mà tiếng Anh là một cái ngôn ngữ à, khá là thuận tiện đối với họ như là Philippines hay Singapore chẳng hạn à, thì cái cái việc chúng tôi sẽ làm tiếp theo đó là đang à, chuyển đổi cái nền tảng Fiju th để thành gọi là customize tức là để làm sao có cái ngôn ngữ tiếng Việt ở trong đó nữa để giúp cho các trường à, bất kể từ à, các trường trung học, tiểu học, đại học, cao đẳng, các trường dạy nghề vân vân à, có điều kiện tham gia vào cái nền tảng Fiju à, với cái ngôn ngữ à, tiếng Việt của chúng ta. I just say about uh, we, we, we are trying to customize the Vietnamese language on three few platform uh, to, to accommodate uh, the request in Vietnam. Yeah, come. Thank you, Roy. Okay, thanks a lot, Kuang. Maybe one last word from Mark and from Joel before we sign off. Mark, any last word? Yeah, uh, thank you for spending time with us. Uh, I enjoyed myself. I'm still trying to answer some of the other questions on the chat as much as possible. Uh, thank you for them, uh, and I hope uh, you enjoyed our session as well. So thank you, and uh, stay safe, everybody. Uh, this is Roy from uh, Philippines, and uh, on behalf of uh, Thames International School and uh, the ACAD Asia team, uh, on behalf of Nilesh in Singapore, Kuang in Vietnam, and all our other country managers who uh, their contacts been shared with you, with all of you, um, please reach out to us anytime. Uh, for those who are asking about certificates that will be issued after this webinar, uh, please answer the exit survey. Uh, and after that survey has been answered, then we will get you, uh, send you our certificates uh, participating here. All right, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you, everybody from all over the world, and stay safe. We can do this together. Education is freedom. Bye bye. Cảm ơn tất cả các thầy cô, à, hẹn gặp lại các thầy cô, à, chúc mọi người sức khỏe và mọi người giữ bảo trọng trong thời điểm này. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Kong. Bye. Bye, everybody.